uh, I want to uh, begin this morning to talk about memory verses. Now, um, Steve or Josh, would, would y'all come down and help me hand some of these out? Uh, if I don't know, we handed out some. Uh, uh, just raise your hand if you didn't get a copy before services, before we got started. And uh, this is a sheet that has memory verses from the first six chapters of the book of Romans. Now, they're easy. You will probably know them. Now, it's, it's not something, it's just fill in the blanks, but you don't get to sit with your Bible and look at the verse and then fill in the blanks. You have to, this is something for you to do at home. Uh, it's not really memory if you just copy verses down and write them in the blanks. Uh, but try to memorize these verses. And there's a point in this, not just so you can have an exercise and seeing how good your memory is, but each of these verses have some relationship to the chapters where you find them or to the section of the book of Romans that they, how they fit into the overall outline. If you recall what we talked about in the last couple of weeks, that the theme of the book is found in Romans 1, as you'll see there on the screen, verses 16 through 17, although I have in the memory verse 18 included in that. We have emphasized that when Paul writes about not being ashamed of the gospel of Christ, it's God's power to salvation. And by the way, on the memory verse sheet, on one side is the King James, on the other side is the New King James. Now, if you want to do both, that's fine. But uh, depending on what your preference is, and for me, a lot of these verses I remember from years ago in the King James, and I, I get a little bit sidetracked when I try to uh, recite those or remember those uh, from the New King James. But these verses have a relationship to the chapters where they're found. Uh, certainly the memory verse, this first one on the screen, has to do with the overall theme of the book of Romans and included verse 18 in the memory because there's a transition there that Paul begins talking about the wrath of God. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And uh, we're going to spend some time talking about that subject. But in chapter 2, verse 11, which just simply says there's no partiality, there's no respect of persons with God, that fits into the context of that because there's a need for the gospel. Everyone has sinned, whether it is Jew or Gentile, God is no respecter of persons. And so that's a very important verse. And then you know 323, what is that? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In chapter 4, he begins to talk about Abraham. And the nature of the gospel is that Abraham was not justified by works of the law, but through faith, righteousness of faith. And, that, and in chapter 5, he starts talking about the blessings of the gospel. Each one of these has some connection to the overall theme of the book and how the gospel is applied or the doctrinal aspects of the gospel in these first 11 chapters, really. But 5 verse 1 talks about being justified by faith. We have something as a result of that, and that is peace with God. And then you know chapter 6, what shall we say then? Can we continue in sin that grace may abound? You, you were familiar with that. And so 623, the wages of sin is death. And so it won't take you much effort at all to, to remember these verses. And when these verses are committed to your memory, when you're looking at the book of Romans, you know what that section is about because you're familiar with these verses. And it, it, I think it'll assist us as we go along. So that's a preliminary thought this morning as we, we uh, begin here this, this morning. And so you can probably do this from memory already. For I am not what? Ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation. For everyone who believes, for who? Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, that is in the gospel, therein is what? Righteousness of God is revealed. These, all, these words all have a significant part in understanding the theme itself. From faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. He's emphasizing the faith already at the outset. And here's a verse that we don't include necessarily in the theme, but one that is very important, particularly in what we're talking about this morning, but also throughout the book. Paul's not afraid to talk about this subject. 
And so he says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteous men who suppress, or the King James says, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And so these, you, you see this verse like that, and you start seeing how these words uh, play with each other, how they relate to each other. And so uh, we'll see some of that here this morning. And so there's the theme that we're talking about. Now, how that, what we're talking about from chapter 1, verse 18, which is where we're going to begin today, all the way through chapter 3, verse 20, is in the context of the need for the gospel. Remember, we broke down the doctrinal part of the book from chapters 1 through chapter 11, then the practical application of the book from chapter 12 to 16. These first 11 chapters are all about the doctrinal aspect of uh, the gospel itself. And in, in that section... We're just emphasizing here, and we will be here for several weeks, the need for the gospel. And that's why you see verses like, there's no respect to persons with God. All, all, are sin, all have sinned. And so it's a universal need. Everybody needs the gospel. That's the first point that Paul gets into. And so that's where we are in this section of cha chapter 1, verse 18, beginning. And so today, we're going to go down through verse 23 of chapter 1. And we'll call this part one of the need. And it has to do with the revealing of God's wrath. Now, at the outset, I want to say a few things about the wrath of God. And uh, what, uh, what kind of questions are raised about it? And one thing in particular, uh, we often want to talk about something else, don't we? Uh, something a little more positive and uplifting you're not going to start talking about the wrath of God, are you? Uh, people don't want to hear much about the wrath of God anymore. You, you've, I don't know if you've noticed that or not, but if you watch any kind of religious program, there's not a whole lot of emphasis upon God's wrath, upon judgment, upon eternal separation from God, or on hell. You just don't hear a whole lot about that topic anymore. What do you hear about more often? Love of God which is certainly a, 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 a very important topic to talk about when talking about God. But equally important is to talk about the consequences of our behavior and our actions uh, and what they can lead us to. And so I want to uh, begin this morning by reading this section and then to, to illustrate this in a number of ways as we go along. But it, I think it's interesting that after Paul makes his introductory remarks and states the theme of his book, which is the gospel is God's power to salvation, uh, it, bring, it puts us in a, a relationship where we have, can see the, how the righteousness of God is revealed, how it is from faith to faith. After he makes that statement, the very next thing he does is start talking about the wrath of God. And you wouldn't probably hear that too much today and, and someone getting up and making a speech or a, a sermon about uh, what they're going to talk about, his topic, and then immediately start talking about the wrath of God. So, and more often than not, we would prefer, I think most of us would prefer to hear something about the love of God. As a matter of fact, when you hear people uh, presenting the plan of salvation or the gospel, as, as however they may view it, the first thing they'll start talking about is that God loves you. And that's almost always, if you watch any religious program, and I know there's one particular individual, whenever he, he comes on in commercials quite a bit, and he starts talking about the, the fact that God loves you, and he died for you, and all that's so very true. But <clears throat> there's not much, much mention about the wrath of God anymore. And so I want to raise this question this morning. Why is this topic neglected so much in recent years? And I hope my voice will hold out through the rest of this uh, time here this morning, but <clears throat> I've, I've had a little bit of cold last week, and I'm fine now, and I did the COVID test. I don't think I have anything to pass on to you, but uh, I'm still a little raspy in the voice. But why is the topic neglected so much in recent years? And I'll just give you, and you can think about it as we look at a few things. Uh, Unbelievers reject this altogether. People that don't believe in God, they obviously don't believe in any kind of wrath of God. Uh, universalism rejects it. What, what is universalism? Everybody's going to be saved. Nobody's going to be lost. 
And there's a lot of Christians that reject this. You can hear it in a lot of places that uh, just don't believe that God could actually uh, have this side of him that would punish people. Uh, and other things, when you look, fire and brimstone is old-fashioned. If you get up and preach fire and brimstone, you will be branded as somebody that's illiterate perhaps, old-fashioned. It's just not, it makes you look bad. People that get up and preach don't want to look bad. And if you start preaching things like this, you'll probably lose an audience pretty quick. Uh, and it's hard to explain, really, in some ways. It's hard to explain how a loving God could actually have this characteristic of wrath. How, how, does, how is that consistent with the love of God? So it might be hard to explain. And if it does make people feel depressed or, uh, you know, I want something positive, something uplifting, no one really wants to start talking about something when everybody walks away, well, I'm just scared to death. People, don't want to walk, people want to walk away with a positive attitude all the time. And so this, it's neglected for that reason. Uh, let me give you some other ideas. Our cu culture pretty much has rejected sin. Would you think that'd be a fair statement? There's no sin. You just watch it on television. There's no such thing as, as judge, you can't judge somebody from, for their lifestyle. That's the way they live. That, who are you to say what's, what sin is? There's, there, sin's just pretty much rejected. And there's no fear of God. You, you think people are, are afraid of God today? A fear, fearful of what God might do uh, in our society? There's no understanding of the holiness of God. Just how perfect God is. There seems to be no concept of that, what holiness is. And there's very little belief in the inspiration of the Bible in the general population. So, do you have a comment, Job? Okay, self-justification. And if you would listen to what people have to say, everybody is up in heaven when they pass away. I mean, it's just the way the thought process is among people. And so, uh, this is not a very pleasant topic to talk about. And so, this morning, as we talk about the wrath of God, uh, I'm not trying to make anybody feel depressed, but the Bible, Paul in particular here, starts out, now we've gone through the introduction, and the first topic he goes to is the wrath of God. And we talked a little bit last week about what motivates Paul. But let's look at this verse in its context, and a few things just sitting there like that by itself. He uses this word for. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Now let's read the rest of it. And, and just remember, this is how he first starts out as he's going to get into specifics of his message about the need for the gospel. And so verse 19, Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things." And so we will limit our discussion this morning down to verse 23. And next week we will continue this from 24 to the end of the chapter. But the first thing he taught, uses, the word he uses is for. Now that's, uh, you'll find, and we'll see it in just a minute, how he uses that word to connect one thought to the next. Uh, the word itself, Strong's has it as the transliteration you can see there on the screen is gar. It's a conjunction. And it's used to express cause, explanation, inference, or continuation. He's using this word. It is making a connection to explain something that he said, to elaborate on, to continue the thought about what he has said. For example, you look at the whole context there, and you see that word for several times. Several times he uses the word for. For example, in verse 16, 
the prior verse had said, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome also. For, the explanation of that is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you, like other places, because, for, because if you want to use that word, maybe not exactly what would be used, but he says, I'm not ashamed. I'm ready to preach, and the explanation is why I'm ready to preach is because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And then he uses the word for again, the explanation of why he's not ashamed of it, the explanation is because it's God's power to salvation. You see how he's fitting it all together. And then when he says, therein is the righteousness of God revealed, the explanation is about the fact that this is salvation to everyone, in that the, there's where the righteousness of God is found. And so when he gets down for the wrath of God, that's connecting that to what he said previously, that the wrath of God is revealed, the righteousness of God is there, from faith to faith. And so if you want to escape the wrath of God, you're going to have to see what, how the righteousness of God is revealed and need to make sure that you apply that to yourselves. For the wrath of God is revealed. Now there's something else to notice in the verses. He talks about the righteousness of God is revealed, but also the wrath of God is revealed. Those are both revealed. And the wrath of God has is revealed. It's it's, it's there. The Bible is clear about the wrath of God. And the righteousness of God is revealed because of there's wrath. And so you can't separate why there is a gospel plan without understanding the fact that there is the wrath of God. The plan of salvation is to escape the wrath of God. And... You say, well, I don't want to talk about the wrath of God. It's, the rea it's why you have obeyed the gospel. You, you would like to say, I love God so much, that's why I obeyed the gospel. Is there anybody in here that would be real willing to say, the only reason I obeyed the gospel is because of the great love that I have for God. I'm not, I didn't think a thing in the world about hell. And I, 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 wish, I would like to say that the only reason I've ever, I became a Christian is because... I just have so much love for God and I'm so thankful that I responded by that alone. And maybe there is somebody who, who does that, but I think in our minds there is this thought of what's going to happen if I don't do what God wants me to do. But at any rate, let's, let's look at this further. To, un to understand God, and I'm not going to talk about all the characteristics of God, but just two things here. Number one is consider the goodness and severity of God. That's in Romans 11. Same book, chapter 22. There's the goodness of God. There's the severity of God. Back in Psalms, the word of the Lord is right. All his works is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. But there is both righteousness and justice. He's a God of justice. He's a God that's going to administer wrath. And there's a lot of verses that talk about it. If you just look over here in chapter 2, again, Paul appeals to the wrath of God to get the people to see why they need the gospel. Look over there in chapter 2 if you're still open in Romans. Begin at verse 5. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do... Do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man who does evil, the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Glory and honor to peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. And so he, he has emphasized it when he starts talking about the need for the gospel. And this is why God's plan is out here, is because there's the wrath of God. And he, he mentions it again here quickly in chapter 2. And so many verses, we could spend a lot of time talking about the wrath of God. Colossians 3, 6, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the everlasting King. At His wrath, the earth will tremble and the nations will not be able to endure His indignation. Knowing therefore the terror, and George, you mentioned this last week in class, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. There is the terror side of God. So if God's wrath seems unfair, be reminded of what sin is. 
If it seems like, you know, I, 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 I like thinking about God's love, but the wrath part, it sort of bugs me. How could God, how could God be, uh, punish people? How could he do that? With his love, the amount of love that he has. Well, think about what sin is. What is sin? What is it, Arlie? Okay, missing the mark. Transgression of the law. First John 3, verse 4. Lawlessness. When you sin, when I sin, we are trans transgressing God's law. We're, we're lawless. Uh, it's defined and described in Daniel 9, 4 through 5 as iniquity, wickedness, rebellion. That's what sin is. Sin is a crime against God. God is holy. His justice demands a penalty for sin. You think more about sin and what it is. God, God has given us His Son. And then we go out and do things we shouldn't do. And it's ugly to God. And He hates it. He hates sin. He knows what sin is doing to you, what it does to me. Now, that's the whole reason He sent His Son. But sin is something that, if you think God's wrath is unfair, we need to realize just how ugly sin is and how dirty it is and how ungodly it is and wicked. It's rebellion. It's like saying, God, I know you've done all these things for me, but I'm going to do this. I'm going to live how I, I want to live. And we do it, we do it often. Knowing that God, what God's attitude is about sin. So if whenever there is a, a stand-up, absolute rebellion against God, not willing to do what God wants to do, that's what sin is. And then turn around and say, well, I don't think God has a right to punish sin when he has given us every opportunity uh, to, keep, to avoid sin. And that doesn't mean we can live perfect, but we have to look at sin for what it is. Now, it's revealed from heaven against, he mentions what it's revealed against. All ungodliness and unrighteousness. That's what the wrath of God is directed toward. So is there a difference between ungodliness and unrighteousness? There, both of those words are there for a reason. And if you look up what ungodliness is, it's impiety or lack of reverence for God. Or saying, I don't believe in God. It could care less about God. There's no, uh, impiety means no pious. You're not, you're not, you don't think anything about God. You don't care what God has to say. No reverence for God. You would just soon to use the name in vain, Lord's name in vain as to say anything else. No concern for God. No, either no, no reverence or just actually say, I don't believe in God. That's ungodliness. And then unrighteousness is unrighteousness of heart and life. And these are in the paper, uh, out in the handout in the foyer, where these definitions come from, from Strong's and Thayer. Uh, a deed violating law, immoral character. The ungodliness is more like your attitude about God. Unrighteousness is what, how you carry it out in your life, maybe how you react to people around you. It's uh, immorality. Th the ungodly things that you do are a result of your lack of respect and belief in God. So he says that wrath is directed toward those two things. And you can see how that when you have no conscience about God, and isn't that what's in our world today? People don't think about God and don't care about God. And that's why you see all this behavior like it is in our society. Now he says, uses this expression, and this is very important. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The King James says what? Hold the truth. What it means is that you're holding it down. You're holding down the truth. Now this is, this is very interesting, and uh, I think we could spend a lot of class time just talking about what, what happens when we do this. And I, I don't want you to miss anything about this particular aspect of how Paul initiates discussion of the wrath of God. Because what is going on is there's a suppression of truth. 
Now, that word means to hold fast, to hold back, or I hold back, I detain or I restrain. Or Thayer says it means to hold back, to detain, retain, to restrain, restrain or hinder. Some translations will use the word. I think the American Standard uses the word hinder. Uh, there's another one that does. To hinder the course or progress of. You're hindering. How many times have you heard the prayer that, uh, that our, I think you said it this morning, Arlie, that our prayer, my prayer not, might not be hindered. We, we think about things that will hinder uh, our relationship to the truth. So men who hinder the truth, suppress the truth, hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now I want to illustrate this. Well, first let me show you some things that Webster says about this word suppress. To put down by authority or force. To keep from public knowledge. And you'll see this, you can see this in the media. You see it on the news. You hear people talking about it. To keep from public knowledge. To keep secret. This is holding something down. To stop or prohibit the publication or revelation of. To suppress test results. To exclude from consciousness. What does that mean? You won't let the truth get into your conscience. You exclude that from your conscience. To press down. To restrain from a usual course of action. This particular uh, understanding is that the truth would have a, a normal course of action, but you restrain it from doing what it would normally do. Or to inhibit the growth or development of. All these things, are, ideas are uh, helping us to see what, uh, what is taking place when he says they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, I want to illustrate it this way. Uh, I was talking to my daughter last night in Maryland, and I was telling her, I'm looking for an illustration about pushing a ball down in the water and holding it down, but I can't... You know, I don't want to use anything on Google because I don't have permission to use anything that pops up. And so she said, well, why don't I just take a ping pong ball and a bowl of water and I'll make you a little video. So here's what she did. This is suppressing the truth. Got to get the slow motion one. You know, always on TV they got the slow motion. So, now that illustrates, I think pretty well, what's happening when you suppress the truth. To hold back, detain, retain, restrain, hinder. What's that ping, that ping pong ball is going to come to the surface unless you hinder it. Now what are some things that you can learn about just that thing by itself, just that illustration? What has to happen to keep that ping pong ball down? Force has to be applied, Lisa. There's some force involved. Now, what does that tell? What does that also tell you? It takes effort. It takes pre-planning. It takes a willingness to do that. It takes thought to do that. You have to be set against that ping pong coming to the top. It's intentional, isn't it? That this don't happen by accident. There is a deliberate attempt to hold that down. And it's held down. That's what suppressing means. You, there's, there's the force, as you've mentioned. Uh, it's, it's deliberate. It's intentional. And this is all very critical when you get into what, why Paul says there's no excuse for this. If you, if you didn't have any control over it, you could be excused. And he will use that word there without excuse in suppressing the truth. Now, what force? You mentioned that there's a force. There is some effort used by people to suppress the truth, to hinder its progress. What is the force? He says it. He specifically uses a word. Okay, but what? In this, illustra in this passage, he actually says they hinder the truth in what? Unrighteousness. That's what it is unrighteousness now you think about how many times you thought about your example you're out in the world 
and you use the same language people do at work, or you participate in certain activities you know you shouldn't, what are you doing? You're hindering the truth. You're suppressing it. it if you were living the right way, the truth would bubble up, so to speak, come up, and people would see it. But you're holding it down. You're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. And that's what he's saying these people are doing. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. What he is doing is, is making the case the wrath of God is fair because of what you're doing, what I'm doing, what anyone does whenever they conceal the truth, hold it back. Now you might say, well, that, I'm not intentionally trying to keep somebody from knowing the gospel. No, you may not intentionally be trying to hurt them, but you are intentionally holding the truth down. You may not be aware of the fact that your participation in something is immoral or ungodly has that effect on them. You might not intentionally want it to take them away from what they should be doing, but you intentionally live it that way, live that way. You are intentional in how you live your life. Nobody's twisting your arm to use foul language. Nobody's twisting your arm to go out and uh, party and do things you shouldn't do. Nobody's making you do that. You're intentional. And so this suppression of truth is, is something you're a willing participant of. Questions or comments? George. Right. No one wants responsibility. Very few people want responsibility for stuff. I mean, I don't, I mean, I know I'm guilty and I don't deserve it. Heaven, he's given it through his grace to me if I do his will. If I don't do his will, I will suffer the consequences. Because there's a hell of a game and a hell of a show. And that's a popular phrase from an old preacher. But it's the truth. Right. And there is a need to, to respect the fact that the Bible talks about the wrath of God and punishment that is to come. I uh, heard one preacher say, uh, somebody had come up to him and, and said, you know, I wish you wouldn't preach about hell. Why don't you talk about the meek and lowliness of Jesus more? He said, well, from the meek and lowly Jesus is where I got all my sermons about hell. Jesus told more story or more, had more to say about punishment and hell than he did about anything else. And he's the one who talks about that more than anyone else. Uh, so it is to be talked about. But in the time we have remaining, notice what he says, and we may have to continue this next week. Because what he says, begin verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and God has, so that they are without excuse. What, what's he talking about? Because the wrath of God is revealed. Because. Because they, they know God. Well, what about people out here in the middle of nowhere? They don't know anything about God. How do you know that? People somewhere in the deepest, darkest park jungles of the world they don't know about God. He says, What may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Since the creation of the world, 
his invisible attributes are clearly seen, understood by the things that are made. You can know that there is a God just by looking at the universe. Nobody has an excuse. You think that there's people, I know there's people who do some horrible crimes. They know that there is a God. There's no excuse. Does that sound too hard? That, does it sound too hard to say that person has no excuse for doing what he did? And you think, well, you're not being very fair. You grew up in an environment where you heard about God all your life and you had the Bible and, and then, uh, then you get up and say things like this person has no excuse. No one has an excuse for violating God's law. Nobody has ever lived who did not live under some law of God. You go back to the creation. Before the law of Moses, did those people have a law? They were under law. Uh, did Cain, when he killed Abel, did he violate any law? People know when they... Do you think people, whenever they... I think about these terrorists and things that chop people's head off. Do you think they know that's wrong? You cannot lay your head down at night after you have killed a little child like they went in there in Israel and chopped up those babies and whatever all they did to those people. You can't tell me that that person can go home night after night and not think about that and what he did was, was wrong. It was wrong. And they know it's wrong. Exactly. Now there's a whole lot more here to, to talk about, and next week we'll continue. If you didn't get a copy of the outline, there's the one in the foyer has, has two pages. On one page is what we've been talking about today, the next page is what we'll be talking about next week. But we're going to get in, this is really, well I didn't get to it here this morning, but he'll talk about the, the general consequences that it comes upon those uh, who reject God and, and suppress Him. And then he will be specific about it in verses 24 and following, the specific sins that he mentions there in Romans. But there's some very general things that happen as a result of suppressing the truth. And uh, we, we want to talk about that next week. I appreciate your attention.